Hi, and welcome to Make America Healthy. My name is Beth Shaw. I'm the founder and CEO of Yoga Fit Training Systems, the author of four best-selling books on health and wellness, and the host of this podcast, Make America Healthy. So we aim to bring you the latest information so that you can take better control of your physical and mental health from an educated, informed standpoint. And before we dive into today's show, which we have the famous Dr. Barry Steers with us again as a repeat guest, and Dr. Mansin Habib, we are talking about injectables, all these weight loss drugs that you may have heard your doctor talk about, may have seen an ad on television, something in a magazine or newspaper, online, social media. It seems like they are all the rage. I do not know much about them, but I also know people who are injecting themselves with a lot of them. Before we get started, I would like to thank our new sponsor, one of my favorite products on the planet, Life Boost Coffee. It's stomach-friendly coffee. It is low acid, shade-grown. It's third-party tested for microtoxins, heavy metals, glyphosate-free, and certified organic. They pay their, famer, their farmers a fair wage, and they use sustainable farming. And I'll just tell you, I'm a huge coffee drinker. And this is some of the best quality coffee I have ever had. So you can save on Life Boost Coffee by going to lifeboostcoffee.com by using the code YOGA15 at checkout. So thanks to our sponsor, Life Boost Coffee. We'd also like to thank our title sponsor, Yoga Fit Training Systems, the leader in mind, body, fitness education for over 25 years. Thank you to our sponsors for making this show possible. And without further ado, we're going to start with Dr. Mansin Habib to tell us, give us a laundry list of what people seeking weight loss are injecting themselves with these days. What are their options? And then we can get into benefits and risks. Uh, Beth, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's an honor to be with Dr. Barry Sears, the famous guy here. Uh, I want to learn a lot from all of you. And let's keep it lively and make it entertaining. I think Beth mentioned something about uh, being provocative. And it's okay if we disagree. We can agree to disagree. And that's what science is all about, is uh, being comfortable with uncomfortable and being open to learning. Uh, that's how we make advance. But I'm a clinician, so I'm internal medicine. I'm a clinician. Just a little background, which will uh, give you an idea of what kind of clients I see. I started as an internal medicine physician and found uh, functional medicine. Functional medicine is real medicine, but asks how things work, or more importantly, why things don't work. I think that word, why. And so uh, Next Health was originally, uh, almost 20 years ago, a fitness center, a medical center, a nutrition center, and it's evolved now to uh, nexthealthmed.com, Next Health Medicine, and rethinking medicine. Now, you have one problem, it could be blood pressure, but there may be three reasons for it. You could have a weight problem and you could have three reasons for it. And I think this subject about injectables and what that injectable is supposed to do, which is uh, to lose weight, but ultimately it's to bring down insulin resistance. That is the elephant in the room. And I think this is a great uh, opportunity to not only talk about the injectable, but some of the other avenues, which are for long-term sustained weight loss. And weight is a really uh, personal thing. For my, had I had that information, had somebody guided me with what the root cause, then it wouldn't have uh, impacted it, it me in the entire life. Weight is not just a weight gain. Weight is not a cholesterol problem. Weight is not diabetes. It's a personal psychological thing. It impacts people's lives. And we as clinicians, our job is to help people. And you can't help them if you don't understand how medicine and diseases impact their life. I think the type of patients that come is all types. Yes, there are a certain age group, certain demographics. Maybe more females are focused on image. But really, I'm seeing young children with not only weight problems, but other metabolic problems, which we can go dive into. And it's not just female. Men have hormones as well. And, and so it's a very complex moving target that this injectable, which is designed to make the insulin more sensitive, is quite a profound statement. And if we just resort to the injection, we're going to miss the main causes, the main drivers, the root cause of uh, obesity, which is insulin resistance. And there are three main reasons. Number one, 
inflammation damages the insulin receptor. Number two, toxins, they uh, stored in any part of the body, but particularly the body fat, lipo. And number three, it's just people that have very refined lifestyle, very refined diets like uh, refined carbohydrates. So the root of, of it is at all spectrum of age, gender, and that's the kind of patients I see. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, bariatric surgery was all the rage. Everyone was getting stomach stapling and gastric bypass. Now it seems like there's a different route that I guess the medical profession is pushing, and that is to inject yourself with weight loss drugs. Can you give us a list, Dr. Habib, of what those weight loss drugs are, like the brand names and what they do? Yeah, definitely. So it's not an insulin injection. That's what people need to understand. Generally, these injections are underneath the skin and it's once a week. They're under two broad categories. One is purely the GLP, receptor agonist. That stands for glucagon. I have to repeat that word loudly and slowly. Glucagon like peptide. So that's a very interesting thing that uh, Dr. Sears and I can definitely uh, debate about how this uh, drug works. The other one is the combination of GLP as well as GIP. Uh, and so the GLP is the most common and Ozempic being quite one of the early pioneers of it. So that's a brand name. The proper medicine is uh, a class of GLP and semiglutide is the proper chemical name. And the other brands that combine GLP and GIP, one of those might be Manjaro, right? And, and there's the slight differences and the benefits and versus risks. So how long does it take if someone starts injecting themselves with one of these drugs? How long do they typically take to produce results? For me or Dr. Sears? No, for any, either one of you. I know, Dr. Habib, you're in practice all the time, whereas Barry is more of a scientist. When are you seeing weight loss in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Are your clients slash patients combining it with diet, with exercise, because we all know that people even were able to out eat their gastric bypass. So how effective are they and when do they start working? Yeah, a uh, very good question. And I uh, hate to hog on to the <laughs> screen. So to see what's going to happen is that you'll end up giving the smartest statements and you'll take all the glory. So unfortunately, <laughs> I just babble and I'll keep on babbling because Beth just told me to babble. I'm going to babble some more. These injectables, um, unfortunately or fortunately, they're amazing. Why is it a double-edged sword? Because I think people may be reliant on them and, and just take the shortcut. The fortunate is it's a game changer. It's a life-saving pathway, really. I've seen it with my own eyes. Adolescents that were over 220 pounds and they're 15 years old, going down the slippery slope of metabolic syndrome, overt diabetes, pretty much. And it's amazing, right? What I would say is that, but it's variable. That's important to understand. The drug is not variable. It's the same drug for everybody, but the results are variable. And I just think that people should stop for a minute and ask ourselves, why is it variable? That means that people are not all the same. Drugs are the same. They would not be FDA approved if they're not identical. And so, look, I've had changes where within one week, somebody lost 25 pounds. Wow. that's It that's didn't even look miracle. like they were 40 pounds overweight, let alone 200 pounds overweight. It was somebody who's relatively slim, but I think they were holding it in the, the belly and the hips and the buttock area. And I didn't even think that they had 25 pounds to lose, and let alone in one week. There are other people that might lose only, say, two pounds. But on average, with these injectables once a week, you can expect anywhere from 15 pounds to 25 pounds. When people are taking these drugs, I, I think that we should also educate our listeners as to what the downside is. I had a professor of finance in college uh, tell me there's no such thing as a free lunch. I know with any pharmaceutical pill, there are side effects. What are some of the downsides of, of taking this? Great. Uh, this is a fantastic question because I think that we may get hung up on all the benefits. And again, it's so amazing. You might want the shortcut. That's why it's so important to understand the mechanism and not just the fact that you lose weight. And frankly, you burn fat. And I think Dr. Sears can talk a little bit more about how uh, we may be, have to be careful and we may burn or lose protein. I'd, I'd be very interested in learning about that. But I think the main thing is that insulin resistance is what this drug was designed for. But what we found is that it was very effective at three things. 
was to curtail appetite because there are receptors in the hypothalamus. The gastric emptying is more to do with the mechanical side effect of just slowing things down in the stomach so you feel full. So if you have less appetite, you feel full, you don't need as much. It, it's an impact on the receptors. For these GLP, there's receptors in the fat. And that's how it's so good at burning fat. What, what, what's the downside? Because there has to be some side effect. This is the thing. The, the, the downside is this, that if you don't know what the root cause of insulin resistance is, once you stop the medication, you may gain the weight back. And are these medications that people can stay on safely for life? It's too early to say because <laughs> many of these drugs are on the market after anywhere from three to five years of study. And by definition, you can only safely say when something is safe for the period that you studied it. So if you studied something for a year, really strictly speaking, you say it's safe for, for that one year period. So I think it's unknown. I myself, I'm a functional doctor. So when I ask the question, I'm glad these drugs work. They're supposed to work on making the insulin more sensitive, but I do know what damages the insulin receptor causing insulin resistance, and that is inflammation. So I'll go check it. That is toxins, particularly in the liver or the body fat. I'll go chasing for it. And of course, people's refined diets. You can do that with a history. So are your patients who are taking these supplements, I'm going to call them supplements, these supplements, are, are they adhering to changes in their diet? Or are they just living their same old life? Maybe they're not as hungry, but we all know that people eat for other reasons beside hunger. I had Dr. Pam Peek on, the author of The Hunger Fix a few weeks ago, and food addiction is a real thing. So where people weigh in, no pun intended, on how much they're eating, is, is this going to cure their stress eating? Are they making diet and lifestyle changes? Are they still going to the gym and doing cardio and lifting weights? Or are they just thinking like so many other Americans think, I'm just going to take this pill or take this shot. I won't have to change my behavior at all. And the pill or the shot is going to do everything for me. Excellent. That's the elephant in the room. Everything starts with behavior. Because behavior isn't just bad behavior. But, you know, how we conduct ourselves based on having three jobs and not enough time to exercise or to go to bed on time. These have profound impacts on the physiology, the circadian rhythm. Just those alone can disrupt and cause hypertension, let alone leaky gut. So I think behavior isn't just about good or bad behavior and stress. I, I think that taking a history should help us understand that environment. And the behavior is part of that environment. And I think you have to do that. And um, so part of it is behavior will change because these drugs are so good at suppressing appetite that if you can conduct yourself in a certain way for two or three weeks, nutrition will tell this over time about the taste in your tongue. It takes about three weeks to change your behavior. So I do believe that these medications can be part of the behavioral change as well. But you're right. If you go and just uh, look at this as a quick fix, so you can go back to the way you did it, for example, having refined carbs or having things uh, where you're eating out and and those chemicals, additives, preservatives, or worse, are now uh, going back into the tissues of the body, into the liver, into the muscle, into the body fat. These are what, are what creates that toxicity leading to the damage to the insulin receptor. That is the definition of insulin resistance. Although we say that high insulin levels are the drivers, but the question is why? And it's because of the receptor. And this is why you should think about the shots aren't the end all or be all, because the shots are designed to make insulin more sensitive. By definition, that means that the fasting insulin levels should be low. High insulin levels not only give you appetite, it's a storage phenomenon. It's a, it's a signal. It's a switch that tells your body to store. You can't be burning things when you're storing things. So the idea is that when you take these shots, the insulin should come down. But in my evaluation, because I check people every month, so my programs are about understanding why people came in for the weight loss, not only to look at the body composition and how much percentage body fat and lean body mass, but I do want to identify some of the other health metrics. And that health metrics is inflammation. So I'll check for that. I'll check for liver toxicity. I will look for gamma GT. It's a very simple blood test. It's a standard blood test, not even a special blood test. And then the toxicity in the body fat can be done with adiponectin and a few things like that. So if you can start by looking at those parameters, so not only can you change their behavior because their appetite has gone down, you can also recommend nutrients and nutrition 
to address the root cause, whether it be inflammation or toxicity. And then beyond that, you can use supplementation. That means to add additional uh, vitamins, so vitamin supplementation, because it can be used almost like medicine, used by the right practitioner, because we can target a gut problem if it's a leaky gut. We can target a liver problem if we see high gamma GT or elevated liver enzymes indicating or synonymous with fatty liver conditions. And fatty liver is like having insulin resistance. If you have fatty liver, the fat is taking the place of the liver cells. The liver cells are active and vibrant, but the fat is stopping the liver cells working. Then you get insulin resistance in the liver. So I'm going and- to uh, pause here and just ask you both a question. This insulin resistance, are people born with it? Is it environmental? Is it 100% lifestyle choices? Educate me, educate our listeners. Ari, you want to jump in? Relative to insulin resistance, it's a term that's been used, but not very well defined for the last 45 years. A better way of describing insulin resistance is something's going wrong with your metabolism. And metabolism is probably the most complex area of biological science known to man. And what causes that to go wrong, basically, it turns out that it's really the diet. Uh, As uh, Mashisha said, that it is an inflammatory condition. And as you have a greater inflammatory diet, you are taking any genetic propensity and basically accelerating it. So our, our first step is saying, what is insulin resistance? It's a lot of things, but it's it basically it's the inability of insulin pulling down blood sugar. And there are so many steps involved in there. And saying which one is, we don't know, except the two are related. If we have insulin resistance, blood sugar is higher, and the body pumps out more insulin to try to bring it down. And as I said, insulin makes you fat. So <laughs> you get an accumulation of stored body fat. Now, relative to uh, these drugs, the GPL-1 agonist, we should ask the question of what is GPL-1? It's a natural hormone. It's evolved with our our species and many others for millions of years. And it basically is naturally activated. So we have the ability to activate GP-1 on a consistent basis. But people say, well, as we get new dietary habits, we're finding that you know Compromise our ability to do that has been compromised. So we really will say this whole aspect of GPO one of in terms of weight loss, it does a very effective job of stopping the hunger in the brain. The brain says, "I'm not hungry." Now, does that burn the fat? No. I was going to say, Barry, because if you take ephedra or any type of stimulant, excessive amounts of caffeine. Some people, they're taking drugs or Wellbutrin that makes you less hungry. Is a lack of hunger the answer to weight loss and insulin resistance? The answer to hunger, to the weight loss, it's really, and we really want to talk about it, it's fat loss. Here's the kind of the downside, the, really the ugly secret about Wilgovi. And this was published deep in the bowels of some very obscure journal. Of the weight you lose, 40% of that weight is muscle mass. So the the result is sarcopenia, which people start experiencing at age 30 and and rapidly accelerates in your 50s. And and that's the first sign of accelerated aging. So that uh, the the day you stop taking this drug, the hunger comes back and you start basically falling back in your old dietary lifestyles. But now the weight regains immediately within the first day or so that you begin to stop the drug. However, you're not bringing back muscle, you're bringing back fat. Yeah. So the day you stop this drug, whatever gains you've got, the regain of weight as pure body fat is going to increase the insulin resistance and increase your likelihood of developing a chronic disease state strongly associated with insulin resistance like diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. Much like the HGC diet that I know some people who were, were administering on other people I understand that most of the people who did that diet, and I believe that was some type of injection also, they gained more weight back. Same premise, Barry? Exactly the same premise. So therefore we say, one, we know what the cause is. It's really a pro-inflammatory diet. Getting people to change their diets, incredibly difficult. A drug is effective, but you have to take this drug for the rest of your life and in the process be losing a 
great amount of muscle mass, which basically accelerates sarcopenia and frailty. So we should ask the question, how do we normally get this uh, hormone to release in the first place? And the answer is the diet. And not just any part of the diet, it's a complex aspect as metabolism is, but first and foremost, you have to have adequate protein at each meal. Now, the number appears to be about 30 grams of protein. That's about the amount you can fit on the palm of your hand. Well, say 30 grams is good, 60 grams will be better. Not so quick. Because as you basically add, go beyond more protein in a meal, you basically shut down the body's ability to burn stored fat. So one of the first aspects is saying, yeah, I like to get about 30 grams of protein at every meal. And another thing that increases the uh, sensitivity or activity of GPO one is fiber. The fiber is broken down in the gut to make short chain fatty acids that enhance the release of GPO one So fiber and adequate protein, where do you get the best sources of fiber? non-starchy vegetables, just like your grandmother told you. A little protein and a lot of vegetables. There is your natural GPO-1 activator. But remember, we're talking about GPO-1. Protein also affects three other satiety hormones. GIP is one, PYY is another. And so if you have the right diet, you can now affect four satiety hormones instead of one. And if you follow that diet, Basically, you now have a lifelong way of maintaining lack of hunger. And it goes back to saying you have to reduce calories. But if those calories aren't balanced, it's going to come back and basically bite you in the wrong part of the anatomy. So what I'm hearing is that anyone who is considering going and, and getting these injections really needs to be working with a responsible physician. And, and we all know that doctors are not trained in nutrition, so that's another problem. But we need to be working with a responsible physician who will really look at your diet and lifestyle choices, too, to make sure that, again, this is just not like you're going to go get your stomach stapled and then you're going to eat small bits of fried chicken and you're going to out eat whatever surgery you had because we've seen it happen time and time again. All of these quick fix things backfire. Do insurance companies, Dr. Habib, cover these medications? Okay, fantastic information that Dr. C is. I, I want to love to engage on, on that. I'm going to circle back. So with insurance, strictly speaking, if you're a diabetic, it's certainly in the formulary. And depending on your insurance coverage, everybody's insurance coverage is somewhat different. You could have a preferred plan and less preferred plan, higher deductible. So generally, if it's insurance-based uh, then and you're diagnosed with diabetes, it's definitely something you can prescribe. I think it is approved by the FDA for weight loss, but I believe most insurances are not covering it, which is an oxymoron, because if you don't help people lose weight and then you get heart disease, your insurance premium is definitely going to be well utilized in a negative way. And uh, who, so make, who, the, who makes money off of that? You know what? I'm going to tell you the dirty little secret. I have Please lots of do. dirty little secrets. I, by I, the way. We want to know all of yeah, the dirty. I, now, now, listen, I, I'm not about conspiracy stories. I try not to, shall we say, because there's so much out there. You don't need me to add to it. That's well, I, I think we need a new name for conspiracy stories, because in but, my uh, experience, a, a lot of them are actually true. Yeah. So, look, I try to be politically correct because most of the time I'm not politically correct. And so because you're a doctor also, correct. so you need to be to... to Sure. Yeah. Look, th these are my colleagues. These are my profession. And the fact is the best way you can make improvements is just tell the truth. And, and let me just on the side, not giving the whole information is telling a lie. Okay. I just got to tell you that. So that's about as polite as I want to be right now. So these are my colleagues. These are my industry. But as I said, as a functional doctor, I can't do justice to my clients if I don't know the root cause and really help them fix it. Let me just give you another uh, definition. Treatment. If a patient goes to a doctor and the doctor says, this is the treatment, do you believe the patient thinks you're band-aiding it? Or do they really trust the doctor in thinking you're going to solve the problem? Question number three, do they really care? I think I'm having a conversation. I have a young doctor in front of me and I, I'm not trying to make him too, what's the word, pessimistic about the environment he's in. But really the caring in medicine is fundamental because when you talk about behavioral change, the number one thing is that the client, the patient in front of you has to trust the doctor. It's nice if they like them also, it's not necessary. If you trust somebody, that's half the cure because you're going to follow the instructions. That means behavior. 
even though it's not written in our history, that's one of the prerequisites of good medical practice, just to have a good rapport with somebody. And we all know what doctors are going through these days. In order, if they're getting covered by insurance, they have to see a good 30 patients. One of my functional medicine doctors, same thing, he was having to see 30 patients a day to make enough money from the insurance companies. And basically, you're cycling people in and out as quickly as possible. You probably don't want to take the extra time just because you don't have it. Maybe you're not educated in nutrition and supplementation on a deep level. So you're at a deficit right there. Some people trust doctors implicitly. Other people feel like I'm putting my health in the hands of someone who may or may not know what they're doing. Yeah, that, did, I, that dirty little secret is about to come out right now. Okay. Which is this, oh. that yes, the pa- doctor should care. Yes, the doctor should have such a good relation with the patient. And because you want to solve the problem. And it goes back to the word treatment. If I'm treating somebody, I'm trying to fix it so you never uh, stay on Wagovi or Ozempic for the rest of your life. And if you want to be on a vitamin for the rest of your life, it might be worthwhile. So the dirty little secret is this. If the doctor, what's the word? So the question is that, is it covered by insurance? And, and if the doctor fixes the problem, there's no reason to come back. And that, that's a problem. If I just go to the, the, the genetics that you're talking about, I, I'm sure the insurance thing will come back. There are two main uh, g- genetics. There's lots of genetics, but I just want to give two examples, should we say. The one is that if you have a propensity for inflammation, that's such a big elephant in the room that not only affects the insulin, but how your joints bother you, how it affects brain and cognition, how it increases the risk of cardiovascular problems, the number one killer for a man and a woman, that inflammation, there's a genetic for that. So if you can figure out if you have that gene, then you can be more careful about monitoring that individual. The other gene is one for the enterocytes. Those are the cells that line the intestines. If you have a propensity for that gene that the cells in the gut lining are not functional, it's because they are not able to utilize glutamine. The doctor was very good at mentioning protein. So not only should you have 30 grams of protein or more in some cases, I think it's 2.2 grams per kilo is what is necessary. But glutamine particularly is an amino acid that supports the enterocytes, that the cells that line it, which are involved in producing the glucagon-like GLPs. I take a glutamine supplement every day and I take a gut glutamine and glutamine. And again, how many doctors are educated to give their clients information on supplementation that's really going to help them. I want to jump to a more practical question and we can keep these answers a little bit tighter because I have a lot of questions today. Dr. Habib, how many people nationwide in the U.S. are on these medications now? Do you have any idea? I don't have the exact number, but I'll tell you how many would qualify for it. You can assume that one third of the population have either insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, or diabetes. I just heard that we're at a 54% obesity rate right now. Wow. And that number is going to be two thirds of the population by 2030, which is going to be a huge health crisis at every level. It's really scary. We're, as my friend Pam Peak says, we are trending upward and not in a good way. So would you say millions of people are taking these products now? Oh, I think that's clear. There were, I think, 300 million hits. uh, Millions of people are are taking it. I'm just afraid, not necessarily the side effect, uh, but the fact is that if you're going to be on it for longer, then the side effects are real. If you use it as a tool to get to solving the problem, really treating the problem, then it's a great bridge. And And that's going to require... That's going to require a tremendous amount of behavioral change, lifestyle changes, habit changes... Maybe you're going to start cooking your own food instead of eating out and going through the drive through So we're expecting people to have really a, a full transformation of the body and the mind when they embark on putting some drug that's been tested for three or five years into their body. I would be afraid to do that. This is why I think you need a very credible physician that cares about the patient because you can see a lot of ads for Ozempic, a lot of ads for Manjaro. You see a lot of ads. But we should not commercialize medicine. Doctors are still somewhat respected. We're going to lose that respect 
if we become part of this economic machine. Going back to the insurance real quick, and then I'll come back to how the, I get the difference is because when you do the genetics, when you look at the bacteria, the microbiome, when you look at uh, the gut function, the diet, when you engage with people, they will make the changes. So my uh, experience is that up to 80% or more will modify their lifestyle, uh, including their behavior. The dead deal secret with the insurance company is this. No matter what the cost of the drug, no matter what the cost of the test, whatever the cost and the expenditure from the insurance companies, they can never lose because they will always make a certain percent above the cost. And what that number is, I couldn't tell you 100%, but I believe it's 30%. So you may say, look, if the insurance companies lower the cost of the drug, lower the cost of the physician's fees, lower the cost of the investigations, then that gross amount, the total amount is lower. So 30% is lower. So the dirty little secret is that the more sick you are and the more times and more expenditure, they'll still make 30% of that. So the bottom line, unfortunately, in the United States is that we make money off of sick, unhealthy people. And I'm not saying me, I'm in the health and wellness industry, pushing a giant boulder up the hill constantly to get people to be healthy naturally. It's a profit machine. And unfortunately, the widgets in that machine are sick, unhealthy people. And until people wake up and realize that they need to take their health into their own hands, and maybe it's reading Dr. Sears's books, maybe it's watching things on YouTube, maybe it's going to take a course in natural nutrition and educate yourself. And even for myself, and I obviously I spend my whole life in this realm, I had some tart cherry gummies in my house for sleep and, and pain and inflammation. And I gave some to a friend, she ate six of them. And she said the next day she felt like she was drugged. So I looked at the ingredients and it was like palm oil and hydrogenated this. And the first three ingredients were sugar and natural flavoring, which is anything but natural. And I thought, wow, I should really learn to read a label. I can't believe that I had this poison in my house, but it's so insidious and it's buried under so many different names like natural flavors. And Dr. Sears could probably educate us a little bit more on some of those other buzzwords that really mean you're eating a ton of sugar and chemicals and all the oils we shouldn't be putting in our body, corn oils and soy oils and palm oil and hydrogenated this and that. It's very difficult even for a healthy person in North America to stay healthy. Barry, can you tell us a couple of ingredients that people should look for on labels that means warning, do not put this in your body? That could be almost anything. The, the fact is saying, let's reverse that, not the bad things. Say, what are the good things? And the nice thing about wisdom, it basically stands the, the test of time. And your great grandmother had some pretty good wisdom. She said one thing, at least in America, you can't leave the house unless you have your tablespoon of cod liver oil, a rich source of omega-3 fatty acids. Today, the level of intake of omega-3 fatty acids is deficit. We need those to control inflammation. She also said, you can't leave the table until you eat all your vegetables. And this would lead to Mexican standoffs. But the fact is, we now know why the vegetables are important. Yes, they basically are low glycemic. They have a lower effect on blood sugar. But the fiber, that boring fiber, is a key player in metabolism to intensify and control metabolic sequences in each of your 37 trillion cells. So Barry, what about taking, uh, there's a lot of fiber supplements on the market. What about taking fiber supplements along with your fiber? What are your thoughts with that? They're not very good. They tend to be uh, usually inulin, things of this sort. But the inulin is, doesn't have the complexity of the plant fibers. You're going to need those because, again, it's the microbes in your gut that break them down to short-chain fatty acids. So it's a source of doing that. But if you're taking in too many omega-6 fatty acids, too many calories, of not enough omega-3 fatty acids, not enough polyphenols. Basically, you're spitting into the wind. So you have to go back to first. What biotechnology has given us the unique aspect is to understand the complexity of metabolism. Our goal, our task in the future is try to teach that to the individual. Here's what you have to do. You've got some skin in the game. If you don't want to play the game, get on the sidelines. But here's what you have to do to use these exquisite control mechanisms to your advantage. Now, if you don't, I'll give you a prescription. You have to take the rest of your life. I've done my job. I had to basically pay the mortgage. 
And I guess we need we need a psychologist on this show today to tell us why people would much rather take a pill or take an injection than do the heavy lifting of cooking themselves three eggs for breakfast and going to the gym every day. Maybe right, doing a little yoga and meditation to manage your cortisol levels and your stress. All about basically human nature. It hasn't changed in about 5,000 years. It probably won't change in the next 5,000 years. That's our challenge. The fact is the drug companies are saying you are basically too weak. You have not enough moral fight to take care of yourself. I'll take care of the problem because you're going to pay for it one way or another. An example, in the UK, these weight loss drugs are approved. They're free for two years. So in two years, you've lost some weight, a lot of it, a muscle. And they say, okay, you've had your two years. Hopefully you've learned your lesson because you're now, you're basically going cold turkey. Oh my God, I'm going to gain the weight back. Say, no, you're going to gain the weight back as pure fat. So you're going to be worse off. But they've made the aspect, they can't afford it. We cannot afford to give every obese person in America will go be shots. Listen, to a large degree, obesity, and I think you'll both agree with me on this, obesity is a choice. It's unless you have some like metabolic syndrome or something. Every day we make choices of how we're going to eat. We make choices of how we're going to move our bodies. And it, it is daily choice and deciding what is the most important use of your time every day? Personally, I believe that your health should be your number one priority always because it's your greatest asset always. And why wouldn't you focus on your greatest asset by giving yourself an hour a day of movement? And then I'm also wondering, and this gets into more behavioral science and human nature, are we just making people lazier and lazier by offering these weight loss drugs and gastric bypass and all of those other things? It's much like a bankruptcy. Oh, if I run up all my bills, I can declare bankruptcy and then be absolved of all of my debt. I don't think it's really much different. Well, I, I think we want to go back to what Marcin said earlier on, saying, what's the underlying problem? It's insulin resistance. I say, that's the problem. If we want to maintain wellness in America or worldwide, that's the number one of saying, how to reduce insulin resistance. And until that becomes the number one focus, we'll be doing these band-aids for the next century. They are temporary. They do not work. That's why I think the long-term aspect of Wulgobi will be a greater increase in chronic disease states because eventually you'll basically go off the wagon either by cost or basically say i'm tired of injecting my drug every week and so, people were metformin was pushed on people five ten years ago i don't know all of the science behind it but i've read reports that it causes cancer so if either one of you would like to briefly weigh in on that let me address it what metformin because we go back to the weight loss the Wagovi does not cause fat loss. It causes stoppage of appetite. What causes fat loss is activation of the master regulator in each of your 37 trillion cells called AMPK. That burns stored body fat. Now, the metformin story, metformin was and still is the primary drug used to treat diabetes. It has an unexpected side effect. It can activate AMPK used correctly. Now, the trouble is that metformin activates AMPK by poisoning the mitochondria. Mitochondria mm -hmm. are the batteries in each of your cells that keep you going. So this doesn't sound like a very good solution, poisoning the mitochondria to basically activate AMPK. So don't use a drug. Use a natural thing like berberine. Berberine has been found in Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. How does it work? It poisons the mitochondria. So, I'm going to throw that bottle that I have in my house out in the trash now. I haven't been taking it. Dr. Nick Pericone, who's been on the show several times, is a big proponent of berberine. But I'm also taking a lot of things to activate my mitochondria. So That's why, again, the more we understand the mysteries of metabolism, the more say, we can take control. If you have no knowledge of how complex metabolism is, basically you're of living in the valley of the blind. We now say, okay, it comes down to say, what can I do to activate AMPK? That's the secret. And exercise is one important aspect. Stress reduction, another important aspect. The third one, and the most important, your diet. So the more you take those three things which are under your control and say, I have one goal. 
I want to activate AMPK because that will also lower insulin resistance. And once you basically cut that Gordian knot, you usher in a new hair era, not a healthcare, a wellness maintenance. Yeah. So as looking say, we have many descriptions of disease. We have no good description of wellness saying, oh, I'm not sick. That's not a good description. A good description of wellness, you have no insulin resistance. That's like being pregnant. Either you are or you aren't. And if you have no insulin resistance, whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. It's working for you right now. If you have right. insulin resistance, basically your future is bleak. Mary, thank you for that. We've got about three minutes left in the show. Any answers? We'll keep them nice and tight. But I've read some studies that there's a direct correlation between waste to brain ratio, meaning the larger your waistline is, the less your uh, cognitive function is online. Do we have any science uh, briefly to back that up? I believe that we do. Uh, if you have, a, say, a large waist circumference, you have insulin resistance, and basically you're spewing out inflammation to all of your cells, including the brain cells. And what happens when brain cells get inflamed, they start to basically die. And therefore, saying it's, this makes perfect sense that the higher the levels of insulin resistance, the more brain cells die. And this is why you have such a striking relationship between insulin resistance and Alzheimer's, your worst nightmare. Interesting. Barry, thank you so much for that. Dr. Habib, any final words of wisdom for our listeners? I think simplifying it is the key and uh, we'll continue on the insulin resistance. I think that it's not just about weight loss. That's why I think if you do it the right way and you address the insulin resistance, what you're doing is increasing the fuel to the cells. The insulin receptor regulates the ability to take the glucose, the primary kind of fuel, to enter each and every cell in the body. But the glucose range is very narrow and it's controlled by insulin. But when, you, when the insulin receptor is not working well, you can't get the fuel from the blood into the cells. Therefore, the brain cells are being starved of energy. The blood vessel uh, cells are being starved of energy. That's why you get blood pressure with insulin resistance. Your liver cells are being starved of energy. So if you don't have metabolism in the liver cells, you get fatty liver. It's chicken and egg. You can go both ways. So really, insulin resistance is like saying you're not giving yourself enough fuel so it affects cognition, your brain function and focus, cardiovascular risk. is the number one driver for heart disease, blockages. It's not just blood pressure. It is associated with the fatty liver. And so really, you got to understand these injections, GLP, uh, glucagon like peptide, are produced by the gut lining. And uh, Barry was exactly right. It's your diet. Don't think about how to feed yourself. Of course, we all love to enjoy to eat. But try to think of how to feed the microbes. The microbes use the fibers and the diverse range of fibers means that there's diversity in your microbes. It's the microbes that make the short chain fatty acids and the short chain fatty acids produce the mucus lining and that protects those gut cells called enterocytes. And on that note, I have a question because I'm about to do my second microbiome test of my life, which is, by the way, not covered by insurance. Are insurance companies covering any microbiome testing? Nope. No. No. Oh, what a problem we have. But here's what, dear listeners, there is a solution. Exercise, eat a lot of protein, do stress management techniques like yoga and meditation. I have so enjoyed this show. What great guests we have. Dr. Barry Sears, we've known each other for such a long time. Thank you so much for being on Make America Healthy. Uh, looking forward to collaborating on my fifth book with you. And Dr. Habib, always such a lively, energetic, and formational guest. Thank you so much for being here. And again, we would like to thank the sponsors of the show, Life Boost Coffee. It is the best coffee you are ever going to drink. You can save 15% at checkout by using the code YOGAFIT. And that's lifeboostcoffee.com. It's natural, shade-grown, ethical, clean, mold-free, which is super important with your coffee. There's a lot of crappy coffee on the market. Life Boost is not one of them. We'd also like to thank Yoga Fit Training Systems. And we look forward to seeing you both on another show as we continue to tackle the very big problem of obesity in America. 
cures and conditions and, and other options. So until next time, dear listeners, have a beautiful, healthy rest of your day. Make sure you're moving your body. And if you enjoyed this show, please share it with others. Thanks so much for listening and namaste.